Okay, so I've got Welsh rugby coaching legend Chris Jones uh, on the channel today. So, uh, yeah, many thanks for your time today. No problem. That's a nice introduction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, you've been on um, an incredible journey, um, you know, from being banned from rugby uh, for life twice uh, to turn into gods, uh, to then having major success um, as a rugby coach. So I'm really intrigued um, to hear more about, uh, about your story. Right, no problem. If I can help. So, uh, yeah, the first question then is, um, how was life growing up for you um, in the Valleys? Um, well, great. I had a really happy childhood. Mm. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, obviously I'm a Ronda boy, born and bred, so I don't know any other sort of life really. Um, mm. But, uh, yeah, um, I suppose growing up in the 60s, early 70s, um, some of the pits were still going in and, um, you know, we had a, a sort of carefree type of childhood. Um, but we were sort of always up in the mountains, always out and about and everything. And uh, things seemed a lot sort of freer and um, less restrictive then than they are today. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but uh, but also I, I would say as well, uh, growing up here, uh, you probably, you know, realise that, um, you had to be able to look after yourself uh, pretty yeah. early in life. Um, you know, it's a tough environment, the Ronda. Obviously, it's, a, um, it's, it's now an ex-coal mining environment. Back then, it was still a, a coal mining environment. And, um, you know, so life was hard for some people. Um, and um, I, I think, you know... Being brought up in the Ronda, you sort of realise, or certainly in those days, you realise that if you wanted respect, um, you either had to be good at rugby or good at fighting or good at drinking. Mm. Uh, I was <laughs> yes. never much good at drinking alcohol, really, but I, I, I want to bother the other two, you know. Yeah. The way out then, I suppose, Chris, rugby. Yeah, well... An yeah, outlet, I mean, release. Took it, yeah, but... I mean, I probably, uh, I wouldn't say so much it was a way out. I mean, uh, I think that people, and I know my mother and father felt this, that people felt um, the way out was mainly through education. Mm. You know, that um, you really got good qualifications in school and then you got a good job and, and probably moved on from the valley. You know? Right. Um, but the, 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 the bit I was talking about really was probably being able to be able to uh, have respect and that amongst your, your friends, amongst your peer group. Yeah. Yeah. Fighting and playing rugby. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say rugby then was more popular then than it is nowadays? Um, well, right now it probably was. Yeah. You know, but um, mm. because I think a soccer uh, for a variety of reasons is fast becoming number one sport uh, in in Wales but mm. um, but you know rugby uh, r rugby has been popular in Wales you know over the last sort of 20 odd years with the success that we've had under Warren Gatland and Sean Edwards winning the Grand Slams and that you know um, yeah, yeah and, and obviously back in the, the 60s especially the 70s rugby obviously was popular then under the likes uh, when we had people like Barry John and Gareth Edwards and JPR Williams and all that was playing. It was popular then, but I wouldn't say it was any more popular than it has been in Wales over the recent years. Mm -hmm. So did you always know then, like, were you always good at rugby from, from a young age? Well, I never played. I never touched a rugby ball until I was 11 years of age. That's when I uh, passed up to the local grammar school to Porth County Grammar School a uh, uh, boys grammar school as it was in we all done the LEM plus exam um, and uh, so we passed it I went up to the boys school and you had no choice uh, the rugby was the number one sport uh, I think really it was the only sport um, a bit later on soccer uh, mm. uh, w w was played as well but mainly you, you had to play rugby you had no choice you had to go to the rugby yeah. trail um, and, and, you know, for me, I just loved the game right from the start. As soon as I started playing, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. But when they told me uh, I 
played uh, open side flank in number seven. And they said, uh, I asked them, well, what, what am I going to do? They said, well, just chase the ball wherever the ball goes. And uh, <laughs> I just thought, wow, this is fantastic. In fact, I couldn't believe they'd invented a game like rugby where you could get mm. away with what you could get away with without being arrested. It was brilliant. <laughs> yeah. I think I read as well, Chris, that you represented Wales in under 15s and under 19s. So obviously, you must have you know, progressed pretty quickly. Yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't actually represent Wales. I was in the Welsh squad at under 15s and I was in the Welsh squad at uh, under 19s for two years. But I never actually uh, was picked to play for for uh, oh, right. Welsh school boys. And uh, even though, you know, a lot of people at the time felt that I should have, I felt that I should have. But, uh, mm. And that probably caused a lot of bitterness for me, really, you know, growing up. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine because I guess everybody, you know, would say that you should be playing for Wales, and then you know you you get confidence from that. So, do you think that like you had maybe like a chip on your shoulder then type of thing? Did you feel that? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, it caused me really to take a, um, a more aggressive. Attitude on yeah. the field, um, trying to yeah. prove it. Yeah. yeah, right. And all the, um, you know, I've said this before. Uh, as rough a game as rugby is, and it certainly was rougher then. Uh, mm. You know, the players might not have been as big as power and powerful, but it was a much more violent game. But mm. there's lines that even in those days you couldn't sort of cross, otherwise you'd get sent off and. As a result of the attitude that I took on a field, um, I did get sent off lots of times, you know. So, yeah, mm. yeah we'll touch on that later. But um, before that, uh, how did you end up playing for, for Triorki then? How did you end up um, playing for Triorki um, RFC? Oh, right, well, I'm, yeah, I'm a, I'm, I, uh, I'm a cummer boy, Glimvark to be exact. Um, mm. That's where I live most of my life. But, um, but when the grass, Please from all attending. And, um, some of my friends uh, were from Truorki and Com Park, uh, and they were uh, got invited playing for Truorki youth team. Um, and so uh, they asked me and a couple of the boys from down in Port to come up and play as well. Um, and so I ended up playing up in Truorki, uh, Truorki youth first. And then, obviously, going into the senior team up there. Yeah, me and my brother did that, actually. Ah, your brother, Clive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. right. So then when you play for Triorki, then is that where your, like, notorious reputation for being, you know, a madman, uh, you know, came about? Was it up there that where you really... You, uh, know? you know, yeah. I mean, there were a lot of tough players playing up in Triorki. Um, yeah. And there were a lot of tough players playing in the other clubs as well. You know, mm. uh, uh, Welsh rugby, again, was a really, really tough environment. And every team had its hard men, its tough guys, you know. Um, yeah. And uh, again, I suppose, it's back to when I was a, a kid. You either had to be able to stand up for yourself or you didn't survive. Yeah. And... Uh, Again, I learned that early on. And if you're mm. going to be prepared to be intimidated and hit the boat, then you're going to have a hard time playing in um, Welsh club rugby in those days. Yeah. And I won't be prepared to, to do that, you know. And I, I, you know, and I suppose things sort of took off from there. Do you see lots of, like, boys then, like, being bullied because they couldn't, you know... Um stick up to the bullies or they couldn't, you know, fight? Did you actually see that, a lot of that yeah, going on? And I, I wouldn't call them, I, I wouldn't say. It was bullies either. It was just the way rugby was, you know. It, it was a man's sport. Mm. Um, and the sort of um, violent aspect of the game was accepted back then. It was a mm. different time, different culture, obviously, from today. Um, and it was something that was accepted, really, in, in the game. Might not have been um, sort of uh, supported by the powers that be in the Welsh Rugby Union, but, but it was an accepted part of the game. And uh, But 
And I would say, you know, that even though uh, I ended up um, getting into trouble a lot of the time and getting sent off and, and Trochi gained a reputation as a hard side, not a place that you want to uh, want to have a nice, quiet Wednesday night game at. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I mean, I I, I remember that we had a really good youth side um, uh, for a couple of years in Truckee. Um, some good players there, and then uh, and and the Truckee senior team at the at the time were a really strong side. And yet, uh, uh, what happened was, is a lot of the um, senior boys all seemed to finish at the same time. So a lot of us youth players was sort of catapulted into the senior team. Eh? And we took our armaments. And some of the boys, some of my friends that I played youth rugby with, basically um, just couldn't handle the armaments that we did have. And I mean, what do I mean by armaments? We had armaments score-wise, but also had armaments physically as well. Physically. <laughs> and some right. boys just couldn't handle it and dropped out. But, yeah. you know, it was the survival of the fittest and... Uh, the, for the rest of us, we stayed the course, and eventually, you know, you sort of start to grow and mature, you know, in your early twenties, and then it's you were time to hand out the armrests, and um, and that's what happened. Yeah. Right. What's the worst thing then you saw on the pitch? What would you say? Oh man, alive! I don't know. Loads of <laughs> loads of things. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, I don't know. Where do you start? I tell you what, I did see. I saw. I saw. You know, uh, uh, people go on about concussion today, and quite rightly so, of course. It's not something that's uh, very pleasant, but it's not a new disease either. And I saw players mm. absolutely kicked in the head Oof, and yes. knocked out completely, be carried off, be sick on the side of the field, and 10 minutes later come back on and play. That's the way the game was. And yeah, they wouldn't go to like, you know, hospital or anything like that see the doctor oh, the next no, day wait. no they wouldn't go to hospital they, because they they'd come back on and play because they knew they couldn't go back in the pub after <laughs> but back to the club because they'd be having too much stick for being yeah. soft but God. again that's the way yeah. that it was a part of the game it was certainly yes. the part of the game uh, in valley's rugby mm. Mm. yeah so then i know that you that you were banned from from rugby twice. So is it, is it right? Are you the only person to be banned from Apparently, rugby? yes. Uh, <laughs> apparently, I am, yeah. yeah. Not something I... It's, yeah, it's not... You know, I'm saying all this now because it, it was what it was, right? But, you know, it's not something that I'm proud about. It's not something that just happened. Yeah. But it, as you said yourself, though, isn't it? The you're, a, you're a product of your environment as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know? yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, what... what so what did you do then to to get banned twice? What what like you know offences did you? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know. Um, uh, I, I I got sent off a lot of times, and um, you you keep accumulating um, the, the bigger bans, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and I got sent off against uh, Trubert in a local derby on a Boxing Day, and ended up. Um, what do you say? Um, I didn't hit them. I I pushed him with my fists, mm. if you like. You know, mm. uh, but I was what was it called? Assault in the referee, and obviously I couldn't do that. And I got banned for six months for that. And then right. I came back, and obviously you know after coming back from a six month ban, which is more than most people had, uh, and then we played against Cardiff in a cup match. And four of us got sent off. Uh, it wasn't a particularly violent match, really. Um, but, you know, uh, it was on uh, on the news, on television. Uh, the, Clive Norlin, who was the leading referee in the world at that time, uh, refereed the game. And I was the first one to get sent off. So I suppose after being banned for six months at Welsh Rugby Union, um, I'd had enough and banned me for life. And Trochi banned me for five years, which I wasn't very happy about. But, I, you know, I do understand. Um, but didn't help my case. And um, so, yeah, and I, so I was banned. And then 
18 months later, um, I appealed against the ban with the help of a great friend of mine, uh, Barrister Leighton Davis. Um, and uh, the Welsh Rugby Union were more or less forced into letting me back. And um, anyway, I, yeah, I come back and uh, after 18 months out of the game and then I got banned again. Then. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And uh, again, I'm not proud of all this. I'm just saying it. As no, it is. no, it's, um, you know. Banned a life, yeah, banned. I suppose after one life ban, the only way they could sort of um, better that was to ban me for life again. So they banned me for life again. Yeah, yeah I've, I've seen the uh, the photos on like the internet of you had like a I'm I am innocent. I think was it like a t-shirt <laughs> that you had? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I weren't. No, I wasn't innocent. Yeah, no. But uh, that's the way I sort of approached life in those days. I suppose. Yeah. So then, after you played, you played rugby. I think. Did you have to, to finish in your early thirties? Due to was it a back injury or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I was having uh, I had back problems, you know, through most of the time I played really. And in the end, yeah. it was, uh, you know, there was no way back, if you like. Sorry, the pun. <laughs> no pun uh, intended. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I was having back problems and that, and then I. I, uh, I got involved in coaching then because my brother Clive was was um, back from Loughborough University um, and he was player coach up in Trocky and because I was banned I was helping uh, coach then you know it was a sort it was like on an informal basis to start with just sort of helping out when he wanted me to and things like that you know um, and then yeah. yeah that's how I got involved in coaching and from there. Obviously, we went from Trochy then down to to Pontypridd, hmm. um, and um, and obviously that was sort of a, a high level. Uh, you know, this is a time before professional rugby, um, and um, yeah, I had a great time down in Ponty. Loved my time there, and uh, obviously it's a big club, uh, and um, we we. we just had a, had a a fantastic time and you know obviously um got involved with some of the top rugby players in Wales and introduced the likes of Neil Jenkins and Dale McIntosh and people that got into senior rugby and uh, great guys great people yeah what was he like then uh, as a youngster uh, Neil Jenkins oh Neil he Jenkins. have a lot of potential yeah well yeah. You know, and he deserves all the success he got. You know, it's something that you use as a, as a coach now. You know, right from a, a young age, he would be down in the field in Clampett Vardra, practicing kicking hour after hour after hour. Yeah. Um, you know, these things, you don't become the best in the world or the best in the country just by accident. It takes hard work. And Neil was always prepared to work at his game. And uh, tremendous, obviously, um, went on to become one of the greats, didn't he? Yeah. So this time then, uh, Chris, were you still getting into trouble at this point when you were, you know, coaching Ponty or? Yeah, I was. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So okay. it was. Uh, yeah. So. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I was never a big drinker really, um, but I just used to, I, I, I could go into a pub or club and drink a pint of milk or have a cup of tea <laughs> um really uh, you yeah. know but then it would be times then when i you know for want of a better word go on a bender yeah and uh, yeah. go out and be drinking all weekend and things like that and and uh yeah alcohol didn't agree with me and um you know, it was like the boys used to say, like fire water to the Indians for me. And and then often I would get into trouble, you know, we would get involved in fights and things like that, or, um, you know, go out partying and stay out all weekend, um, which was okay, except for the fact that I was married with three small children. And, um, um, you know, and so I wasn't living a life that a husband and father should live. You know? Yeah, yeah. And again, it's not something I'm proud about. But you asked me the question, so yeah. 
Yeah, well, I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's remarkable, really, how you turned your life around. Because I think, is it in 1990 where you ended up in, in Brecon, in, in, in the prison cell? Yeah. And you'd gone to, is it the Brecon Jazz Festival or something like that? And then that's when you found God. Um, yeah, I, I mean, understand. you know, yeah. I mean, I, I was interested in, Sonny, that you said earlier, I found God. And it sounds like some mystical, mysterious thing, you know. And it wasn't like that at all. I mm. mean, I, I, I'd gone to the jazz festival, never been up there before in my life, never listened to a jazz record as far as I know in my life. Um, mm. You know, I was always into Bob Dylan or the Rolling Stones or something like that. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah, but... Yeah, and obviously I got locked up for uh, fighting um, and uh, got charged with uh, wounding with intent and violent disorder um, for attacking an, an undercover drug squad officer. And right. so I was in, you know, serious trouble. And the thing was, I hadn't done, they, they said that I'd stabbed him. I was kicking his head in on the floor and I stabbed him. And I didn't, I would have if I could have, right? Again, <laughs> to say the truth. You know, because I thought he'd do it a friend of mine. Obviously, we were all stoned on um, drugs and drink and things. And mm. um, But I was in big trouble. And, you know, I, I say this all the time is, you know, they were, when you're desperate, when your back's against a wall, you really can't find a way out. You can't fight your way out and you can't talk your way out. Who do you turn to? And, um, and the, I saw... In a police cell, cold, dark, um, you know, I, I, I just thought, how can I get out of it? And I just got to the point of just saying, God help me. It's just mm. uh, thoughts, if you, you know. Yeah. And then I thought, well, you know, I had, uh, God help me. I, I didn't even know if I believed in God. Um, and then and I got thinking and I was thinking, well, if there is a God, why would he help someone like me, all the things that I'd done? And then I just got, I thought about it all and, you know, lots of things that I'd done that we, that we haven't even talked about. And the stuff that we have talked about, I'm ashamed of, but the stuff that I, you know, don't want to talk about that I'm really ashamed of. And I just got to the point of saying, well, God, if you're there, I'm sorry, I, yeah. and, I, and you know, I wasn't on my hands and knees. I didn't have my hands and it together on the air or anything like that. But I've never meant anything so much in my whole life. And I, I just thought, and um, I want a, a new way to live my life, if you like. And um, I saw no choirs. I know we had no choirs of angels. I didn't hear it, see any flashing lights or anything like that. But I just had a feeling inside that if I if I was to go God's way, whatever that may way meant, I didn't really know. But it, if I was to go this God's way, then my life would change, and I would have a new start and a fresh start. Mm. And uh, and the and the only way you know it's difficult to describe a sort of born again experience, if you like in inverted commas, because that's what it is. But it, mm. but, but it really was for me. And the, the only way I could describe it was the feeling of God's way was a good way, a right way, a true way, if you like, of, of living, a clean way. And I haven't felt like that for a long time. You mm. know, I mean, going out on a Friday night and not coming back until Monday morning to go to work and, and all of those things and, you know, I'm waking up and not knowing, you know, where I'd been and what I'd done and, and all the rest of it. Mm. Uh, you know, I mean, hey, everyone's got to choose their own path and everyone's got to, I'm not going to Bible bash anyone. Everyone's got to make up their own mind. But for me, it was, the feeling was, this is a good way to live. This is a right way to live. But exactly what it all meant, I, I wasn't sure, but I just felt that this God had something to offer, mm. a better way to live life. Um, and that's how I was started, really. 
And right. uh, as it happened, I I didn't uh, expect them to go on remand down to Swansea Jail, and and I didn't. They gave me conditional bail, which allowed me to go home and to explore more about God's way, if you like. And uh, and that's how it all started. Yeah. Wow. And at that point, then, um, so you had like a. I guess a new lease of life, a new sense of purpose. Um, how did you end up going to Romania then to do to do charity work from from there? Oh well, uh, right. So I had to go to Crown Court eight months later, expecting to go to jail, and thankfully uh, I ended up being fined and having and being bound over to keep the peace or something like that. I can't remember exactly, you know. But um, so. Friends of mine had um, started doing some work out in out, out in Romania after um, the revolution that was there in 1990. Well, you know the I say revolution. You know the Romanians would say it wasn't a revolution. It was uh, just like a change of government and uh, a change of regime uh, from the communist uh, the regime under uh, Ceausescu. Um, oh, yeah. And so the country was in a turmoil and um, they turned out that uh, under the communist regime, there were these orphanages where kids were sort of just sent or parked off, you know, because people couldn't afford them. And um, the, the way the kids were treated in the orphanages overall was horrendous. Um, the country was poor, but the orphanage, orphanages were extreme poverty. And um, and so, yeah, so I got involved with a couple of my friends and uh, they invited me to come out and, and help. Um, so I went out there, we were out there for two or three weeks, I think, something like that, you know, working in the orphanages, which is a really, um, yeah, very interesting experience. Some sense is really sad, but in other sense is really uplifting as well. And mm. the guys, you know, I, I just went out there once, but the guys uh, went out there a number of times, taking out aid, um, you know, um, sort of medical aid and doing some work out there as well in the orphanages and just trying to help these kids to have a better life. Yeah. Oh, great thing that you did. Um, yeah. Um, so did you, after that then, did you still have rugby in your mind or did you like take a, you know... No, 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 yeah. no. Yeah, I just thought the rugby was the the, pro, the, the, the root of all my problems. Right. And so, my, you know, I, I started going to church and started to explore more about the experience I'd had in the police cells. Hmm. And um, I basically, I, within the first couple of weeks... Mm-hmm. In the first couple of weeks, just sorry, Minister. Ah, no, no problem. Don't worry. Yeah, in the first couple of weeks, um, I, you know, I, st- I thought, right, where do I go with this experience in a in a in the police cell? So, I thought, well, the obvious place to start is church. And um, so, but uh, I came back from uh, from court in Brecon, and uh, I was, uh, I, as I said, I was uh, on a, this conditional bail. I thought, well, I can't go to church because it was early in the week and they'd only open on Sunday. So I went round to see the vicar um, because that was the only type of church I knew. And, um, and I went round to see him. And he invited me in, and he was a, a lovely fella. And I tried to explain to him what had happened to me. And, I, and what he said was, was he said, look, he gave me a Bible, asked me if I'd read the Bible before. And I had at different times in my life, the Navi in school, but I didn't really understand it. Hmm. So he said, look, go, go away now and, and pray I'm like, what do you mean pray? Like, our Father who art in heaven. And he said, no, you know, speak to God like he was speaking to me. And he said, ask him to help you to understand the Bible. And I thought, right, okay. And he said, but read the gospel stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
And he said, and you'll read about a person there called Jesus Christ. And I thought, right, okay. So I went home and I started to read the gospel stories. And it just blew me away about this person, Jesus Christ. Now, I thought that I knew who Jesus Christ was. This guy who, who went around in white robes, hmm. um, meek and mild. But when you read the, the actual Bible and read, and I'm not talking in a children, little children's Bible, you read in a Bible, a readable Bible, man, not one that with all of these and those is, because that's difficult to understand. There's much more to Jesus Christ than what I ever thought, than a little picture on a Christmas card. Yeah. That Jesus Christ really is someone worth following. And I, I, I defy anyone. You know, people talk about, our oh, religion. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about, if you like, a relationship, a personal relationship between a human being and God. And I'm talking about, I'm talking about a completely new way of life, an alternative lifestyle. And I, I defy anyone who, to read the words of Jesus and find out and point something that he did that was wrong or something that's bad about that lifestyle. Mm. This world would be a much better place if mm. we could live by his words. Read the, 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 the Sermon on the Mount in uh, the first chapters of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. Those words don't just change people's lives, individuals' lives. They change all movements. You know, uh, like the civil rights movement in uh, in America was based on those words with the likes of Martin Luther King. Hmm. And uh, and so I had a, an all new way of life. And it was, as I said, it was it was alternative. It was clean. It was good. It was pure. And, and I just thought, wow. And, and I just realized that, that Jesus Christ is who the Bible says he is. Mm -hmm. He is the son of God. That's who, the, that's who he claimed to be. Or he's a liar. Or he's a lunatic. And you read his words. And I, I don't think anyone can say he's a liar or lunatic. Anyway, I'm telling you all that because I had a new way to live life. So rugby wasn't part of it. And then a couple of years later it was um a pastor friend of mine who sort of um encouraged me to get back involved my brother clive was still uh, was had gone from pont de Prix back to trochi to coach and he was open i was going to come back up and help him and i as i said i had a new way of living life I, it's not part of my life anymore uh, but it was a pastor friend who said you know Rugby wasn't a problem, Chris. It was your attitude that was a problem. Hmm. And um, there was a yeah. lot of frustration in my life and, uh, you know, not living up to the expectations that I had for myself and others had for me, really. And so it all came out in rugby and in, in my lifestyle. But, um, yeah, so it was sort of reluctant, a bit reluctant at first. I got back involved. And uh, but then after a while, again, I, you know, it's a, a, a like a biblical value, if you like, a, a good Christian value that you know, if you're gonna do something, then do it to the best of your ability. And so that sort of you know, I got back involved gradually, um, and then before long, you know, um, I'm right back in there, but mm. with a different approach from the old days, you know. Yeah, I can imagine, like, you, you saw rugby through a different lens then, the set, yeah. you know, the second time round. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, we we coached up in Trochi uh, for a while. Um, and it was, you know, there was during the time that the BBC uh, made a documentary, The Dream Rugby Was Changing. It was becoming um, professional. It was... Uh, So yeah, just picking up, Chris, from um, where we left off. You were saying about rugby becoming professional. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, I, so yeah, the game was changing. Um, but it was exciting times, really. Um, and 
and uh, the top division. etc um, on merit you know um, but out, out of that time um, a school's work started up in up in Trogi and um, I was uh, they wanted someone to edit up and uh, I hadn't been a Christian that long um, and um, I could. I, I, what I didn't want to do as a as a Christian was to just be a, a poo filler, if you like. I wanted to put my faith into action. This was real to me, and I wanted to put it into action to try to help others. And uh, I thought of, you know, maybe uh, being a missionary and going overseas, maybe going to somewhere, uh, you know, where. Uh, we, we, myself and my wife became a Christian. We were thinking of maybe going to China or something like this, you know, moving there. And but uh, it's like uh, my pastor friend said, you know, Chris can't speak Chinese. So that, uh, that that was a bit of a, a <laughs> obstacle. But yeah. it was like, well, right, okay. What what do I know? I uh, the, the thing I knew best of all really was rugby. And when the opportunity did go, came up, up to start coaching the kids in the school, thought, right, okay, you know, maybe this is it. And, but right from the start, I knew right away that um, this was really something I could do to help the, the community, help the kids in the community. You know, and, um, yeah, I, you know, and, and, you know, I, at the end of the day, I'd been where they, they were, you know, or where they are. Um, you know, I... I I was captain of Ronda schools. I played, you know, in the Dewey Shield season and played schoolboy rugby. I played youth rugby. So, um, you know, I probably you know, was in a position to be uh, able to pass on our experience and uh, was coach, you know. And that really yeah. excited me even more than coaching rugby at senior level. Right, so, and for those who don't know, uh, the, du the Dua Shield, what, what exactly is that uh, competition? Well, the Dua Shield, du Dua Shield is the oldest schoolboy rugby trophy in the world, and the biggest. It's a massive thing, um, and it's uh, been played for by most of the greats in Welsh rugby. We're going back to the old days of Cliff Morgan and uh, through to Barry John, Gareth Edwards, J.P.R. Williams, uh, Gerald Davis, through to people like uh, Martin Williams and Gethin Jenkins and up to the modern day players like Sam Warburton and Alan Wynne-Jones. Remember those boys playing uh, Sam Warburton for Cardiff schools against Ronda and uh, Alan Wynne-Jones. Uh, I remember him uh, playing for Swansea schools against Ronda schools in the semi-final the Dewey Shield uh, up in Porth and they beat us 12-10. Um, you know, so um, it's, a, it's a real... Famous and uh, a competition, very competitive. Is basically then it, uh, Wales is sort of split into about twenty five district teams, and they range in size from maybe uh, something like Carmarthen schools, which will have just three schools. Uh, Ronda will have six schools. Cardiff will have about twenty five schools to pick from, uh, and the best, best play from each of those schools come together to play the districts in the, in the Dewey Shield. The final then takes place at the end of the season down in the Principality Stadium. Yeah. Right. And I know that you're one of, if not one of the, the most successful uh, junior coaches the game you know, has ever seen. I think, um, how many titles uh, have you won? Like being the coach, is it nine? Nine Dewey Shields? Yeah, well, I, I don't less. know about that. But um, what, what I do, yeah, since 1991, I do Shield 10 times. Um, and we had right. one before that. Um, you know, in 100 years before, it's been going since Dewey Shield has been um, going since 1904. Um, Ronda wow. Schools, the Ronda Schools Rugby Union got to the final in 1965 um, when they lost to Regend. 
Um, but we've been we managed to win it through a lot of hard work since uh, since 1999. We've won it ten times um, and lost in the final about six times. Yeah, but um, yeah, you know, but the, that, that's all great. But the most important thing for me is to see these boys become the best that they can be. Yeah, that's really our uh, strapline or motto, if you like. Be the best you can be. For some, like Matthew Rees from Ton Revel, mm. um, he came through and obviously capped in Wales and played for the British Lions. And that's fantastic. And we've had eight other boys have come through to play for Wales, you know, um, in the last 17 years, since 2005, since Matthew did it first of all. Um, but as I get as much pleasure out of boys playing for the local clubs mm. and maybe more pleasure for those who managed to get a discipline and a focus in their life that, mm. you know just be able to maybe stay out of trouble yeah you know um, to a 14 or 15 year old boy I can help you to become a better person or to get a, a discipline or focus in your life, he's going to look at me as if I'm weird. If mm. I tell him that I can help him become a better rugby player, then mm. he's interested. But yeah. the process, the process is exactly the same. Mm. Exactly the same. And we sort of emphasise the importance of discipline, of uh, team ethics, being able to work together with others, of uh, building up the boy's self-esteem. Uh, which is a big deal for kids in Aronda, hmm. helping them to be confident without becoming arrogant, uh, because there's a uh, you know a thin line between the two, but there is a difference. Um, and then and you know and to do it through um, sort of emphasizing well-being, which is a big deal today. The word well-being, I mean, for me, it just means you know. Um, being prepared to to train hard, to, to not just when they're with us, but when they are on their own. If they really want to get the biggest benefits, you know, to get to the gym a couple of times a week, to get out running, to eat mm. healthily, mm. all those things, you know, will help them to become better rugby players, but also help them become better human beings as well. Mm. Yeah, see, very much then still part of that um, uh, coaching setup. Uh, part of it, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah, well, that's that's what I know about that, that's what I love to do. Mm. And then, in your time in, in rugby, yeah, maybe it's a difficult question to answer, but who would you say is the best player that you've ever ever coached in your career? Oh, uh, oh no, I would, you know, I've uh, um. Well, you know, at, at senior level, I coached some really, really good players. Um, David Evans, Carl's uh, outside half, the play up in uh, up in Trophy when we were, was a tremendous athlete. Flanker, uh, Scarlett Flanker was a outstanding player. Although he was coming to the end of his career. When he came to Trochi, and then there were lots of others, um, lots of others. Andrew Dibble, I think about, uh, um, and 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 lots of lots of others as well. But with with the schoolboy level, I would never pick one out of mm. uh, you know the world of every one of them. I think the world of the good players and the not so good players. The, the good boys and the and the naughty boys, every single one of them, I thought the world of, mm. and uh, and you know the fact that some of them have gone on to play top level rugby is fantastic. But um, yeah, but every one of them I, I've uh, enjoyed coaching. Um, some have challenged me more than others, but it's been a pleasure, fantastic. Mm. And then. Where do you think you'd be now if you weren't involved oh. in rugby? 
Well, where would it be now if I had not uh, uh, that experience in a police cell, you know, from one of the lowest points of my whole life, it became the absolute turning point of my life. So where would I be now if I hadn't committed my life to Jesus Christ? Who knows? I could be dead, more than likely, or in jail for a long time. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think in some ways that, like, it was kind of a blessing what happened because of where you are right now? Because, you know, it took, it took you to, you know, to be in that, that cell to kind of make you reassess things and to, you know, to sort your life out, basically. Sonny, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, yeah. Hello. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you heard the, the, the last ah, part yeah. of that. Yeah, yeah, I'd probably be them? dead or in jail. Ah, yeah. Yeah. If hmm. I hadn't become a Christian and my life hadn't changed, that's where I'd be. But yeah. uh, as a result, I've, uh, I've had a fantastic last 32 years. Hmm. Um, you know, my family life was restored after being in a complete mess. My, my wife who wanted to divorce me and wanted nothing more to do with me. Um, our home life changed completely uh, from being a war zone to uh, being a uh, just a um, just what can I say? Just uh, it's not uh, it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, hmm. but um, peaceful, you know, suppose, a contented, yeah. a peaceful, contented uh, home life. You know, we have four children and all grown up and married and uh, eight beautiful grandchildren. Um, and who knows where they could have all ended up if I'd carried on the same road that I, I was on 32 years ago. Hmm. Does it seem like 32 years ago that you, you know, changed your yeah, life? No, I, I, I mean, it doesn't actually, you know, of course it doesn't. Um, but I suppose most people could say that about life, couldn't they? You know, you look back and you think, where is it all gone? But I've enjoyed the last 32 years. I've enjoyed almost every minute of it. I can't say it. Sometimes you, of course, you are, everyone has their down times and their tough times and their challenges and everything. But um, it's like I said, you know, by becoming a Christian, I have a, a hope, not just for this life, but for the future, for eternity as well. Hmm. And so, you know, yeah, it does allow you to see life with a different perspective. Hmm. Yeah. And then um, how would you like to be remembered, Chris? Oh, I, 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 that's up to other people to decide, <laughs> you know, man alive. I don't hmm. think of things like that. That's completely hmm. up to others to hmm. decide, you know. Mm. I wouldn't put any sort of add-ins on anything about me, you know. But you've done, you've, you know, you have done, I know you're very humble, but, you, you know, you really have done done well. And I think you've inspired, you know, thousands of Ronda boys to, to become better people. So I think, you know, maybe you're not giving yourself a, a, enough credit there. Right. Well, that's very kind of you to say that. But I'm glad you said it, not me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'll say it. <laughs> no problem. Um, so, so yeah, moving forward then, um, what, what's your plans? Um, do you have any plans or do you just, you know, take each day as it comes now? No, of course a plan. Um, you know, uh, failure to prepare is preparing to fail, as uh, Vince Lombardi famously said. Um, uh, you know, at the moment, I'm just thinking about uh, the present side we're preparing for the Dewey Shield. Um you know, a the, the, uh, great group of boys who are really, really working hard. Um, they lost out on a lot because of COVID, this particular age group. And yeah. so we really are meant to work extra hard with them, you know, mm -hmm. but they're uh, putting the effort in. And, uh, you know, that's all a coach can ask is that. 
yeah. work wise anyway is to try and help these kids be the best. again you know uh, yeah. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then what advice would you give to someone who's thinking about taking up rugby or, or you know playing rugby in general what, what advice would you give to that you know girl or boy oh well, so yeah what would i what advice would i give uh, i would yeah. say be prepared to work hard to get the most out of the game um, but it's a great game it's tough it's a tough physical game can't hide away from that, hmm. um, but that's what that's what attracts uh, people to the game as well. Some may be turned off by that, but I just think that it's, a, it's got a special attraction, uh, especially for uh, Valley boys, you know. Hmm. And um, and to get the most out of anything in life, you've got to be prepared to to work hard. And if you are, do work hard, especially in a professional era, who knows whether you know. Uh, the sky literally is a, is a limit, and it is interesting that at the moment, um, you know, there's a, a lot of interest in Valley players. Um, mm. Obviously, from we, we've had a lot of boys playing for um, Cardiff Blues or Cardiff Rugby, as they call now, and uh, but the English clubs as well are showing interest in that in the boys, which is all very interesting, but yeah. um. You know, you you've got to be prepared to put that effort in, and uh, and um, when you don't feel like it, you know they say all the way along that the the difference between the very top level players um, and the rest, uh, the likes of Alan Wynne Jones and Sam Warburton and the rest, uh, that they even when they don't feel like training, even when they don't feel like putting the effort in, they still do it. Yeah. And that would be my advice to any youngster: be prepared to work hard. And then when you work hard, that's when you uh, and you you game improves. Uh, that's when you get the real enjoyment out of it. Yeah, I agree. And then, what about advice to someone who's thinking about getting into into coaching, into rugby, rugby coaching? Yeah, what advice would I give? I would say um, get out and coach. Simple. Now then, mm-hmm. that doesn't make it easy. Notice I said simple. You need to, to start at a, um, a low level, just getting maybe helping out in the local clubs, um, finding out one of the younger teams that need uh, a coach or need um, a, a coach and needs help and get alongside him and just have a, get the, the confidence of standing in front of a group of, of youngsters and... Uh, and be able to coach, and then you know, as you, it doesn't take massive um, tactical knowledge or anything else at the lower levels. Uh, you know, with the, in the clubs or whatever, it just needs someone to to get alongside them and and to encourage them or whatever. But then, obviously, the more times you do that, the more confidence you get. Then, obviously, as you start to go up higher levels, then you do need to be able to understand the game and um, you know and uh, and then obviously you need to embark on the, the Welsh Rugby Union coaching courses to get uh, qualifications to back up what you're doing as well and uh, and the courses are good uh, you know and they do help in um, giving you more knowledge and that as well but the, the most important thing is to get out and coach you know, to have the confidence in standing in front of a group of people, obviously starting with the youngsters is easiest, um, and and just learn to coach, learn to communicate with people. Yeah, communication is key, isn't it? And it's like Absolutely. sometimes these days, um, you know, with all like social media and stuff, sometimes you know the communication is not there. At least like the you know. The, the old-fashioned face-to-face communication. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. That's why I don't do social media, maybe. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah, yeah. So you're not on social media at all then, Chris? You don't use... Not at all. I don't, I don't understand, don't understand mm. his concepts, really, but uh, mm. yeah. Yeah, right. 
Great. Okay, Chris, I think we, we can finish. So, you know, many thanks for your time. Really enjoyed listening to your story. Very, you know, inspirational. And um, I'm definitely going to take some things from what you've said today. Um, yeah. So um, you're not on social media. Is there any way that people can contact you? Or I don't know if you use... Well, if they, if they want to contact me, they just need to pick a phone up or, mm. or uh, come and see me. Yeah. That's the way to contact me. But That's thank it. you, Sonny. And... Uh, all the best in your ventures and that on these, um, yeah, what they call them, I, I don't know, these, what do you call them, these interviews? Is uh, it, is yeah, yeah. Person? What, would, what yeah. would you turn this? Uh, I guess it's, yeah, like YouTube, I've got a YouTube channel. Uh, so this, oh, this, right, okay. this, yeah, so this video will go on to YouTube. So yeah, just do okay. just um, interviewing different people from different um, fields, you know, um, right. like my background's teaching. Uh, I'm an English teacher, right. but I also like interview yeah people from other fields who can, you know, motivate and inspire others like, you know, like yourself. So, yeah, thanks a lot okay. for the, um, you know, um, yeah, well, good well, wishes. Well, you're doing a good job. Well done. Well done. And, uh, all <laughs> the pleasure. best in your Thanks, no Chris. Problem. Okay, all okay. the best to you as well, and uh, okay. speak to you soon. Okay, cheers. Bye. Bye. Okay, bye. Thanks, Chris.